<laughs> so we may be looking at the eight o'clock that you were talking about. Oh, gosh, well, I think a lot of people have already met Dr. Boudry, and he is a professor at the College of Southern Maryland, and um, we've had him present on a number of other topics for us. He's very popular with his students because, um, not because he's easy, I just noticed that that's your lowest part, the lowest part of your mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But he really brings some history alive, and I thought he was a, a good choice for uh, teaching us a little more about her blog, what was going on in America when um, her blog was writing these cartoons. And, uh, and, and I think what we're going to do is, um, again, we're going to take a little bit of a look at it through. We have a seven-minute DVD that we're going to present for you that will kind of give an overview, talk a little bit about his work, what he did. Uh, after which, uh, we'll talk a little bit about why he chose the medium of cartoons and the purpose behind it. Um, as you mentioned, uh, your husband was an artist, he was brilliant. Indeed, he had a clever, creative way of being able to express what he wanted to do. So we'll take a look at that, why he used that, what was the purpose behind the critiques, the, um, you know, the questioning, and, and his goals, some of it. And we'll take a look at some of his cartoons, look at the obvious messages of what was being portrayed with, and then look at the subtleties. Why did he make the drawings he did, the shadings? What, was the, what were the things in there that could make us look more about the person himself? And then maybe after comparing three or four of his works, we can kind of get a more general feel about who he was through his work and uh, enlighten our understanding of the wonderful things that he did. So, I'm sort of trying to So, we want to avoid the thing that we can do. Okay, so we're going to start with the first one. behind why he chose cartoons to critique. And that gets into also looking at why would someone, why do people generally in societies critique questions when they can um, their governments, policies, his or her political cartoons. What is the purpose why? Why do people generally do that? Why do they decide to critique or to question or to challenge the various forms their governments or their policies? So what possible purposes do they have? Okay, to bring awareness is a great example of it. You say that there's a maybe maybe people aren't aware of what's taking place here. Maybe we can share that, get more of the light of thought. Other reasons maybe they do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And England? They're working in the fiction pattern in the Reformation, uh, Rome. They had drawings. Uh, you can kind of look at some of the walls, even in ancient Egypt, where certain things were going to be used up sometimes uh, when they could on the different dynasties in there to critique. Uh, and some of it was awareness. But why else might somebody do that question or challenge beyond just making people aware of their other. It's just their way of expressing themselves. Maybe they're not. They're mean, exactly. Maybe they're not comfortable making a speech or even talking. Maybe they are very even introvert, very quiet. But this gives them a way of being able to do that, to let their message be known um, for that. Whether it be on a purpose beyond just an awareness of, of the message that's there. And so a constructive way why they want to call to action. And possibly a cartoon or a depiction there might be something not only make people aware, maybe they're like, People need to know that something needs to be done about this. 
And so instead of you know grabbing signs and, and trying to you know, mass mobs for people, sometimes a simple drawing of cartoons or something like that can resonate with people. Uh, you think about our own country when it comes to things common sense and the lecture on that today. Um, really ignited people in ways that, that other things may not have been able to do. So sometimes there's there's purposes behind that. And looking at that kind of gives us a message for the book that indeed maybe he was looking at doing that. We know a little bit about that. The video DVD's gonna talk about it. Is it ready? Well it's uh, it is we'll see if it might you know it hasn't uh, downloaded completely. Download we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay. So, you know, uh, I'm you want me to, to turn the lights off here? Yes, that would be great. <laughs> He wouldn't let people get away with anything. People were astonished when they got to know her book because they assumed from the drawings that they had seen that he was this vicious, opinionated, acerbic, hard-hitting, hell-raising kind of a guy. And instead, he made this sweet, kind, gentle soul. And people would say, no. He, he's not the guy who does those drawings, can't be. The youngest of three boys, Herb's favorite way to spend his afternoons was drawing with chalk on the sidewalk outside his house in Chicago. His doting parents instilled in their children a sense of responsibility for one another, the community, and the country. The youngest in his class at the Chicago Art Institute, her drew faces from the news, adding captions and comments. His cartoons got him a weekly column in his high school paper. After four years cartooning with the Chicago Daily News, he was hired by a national syndicate. In 1933, all of America could read her block. He prodded his readers to think about the problems facing them at home and abroad. His views nerved his conservative bosses and won him his first Pulitzer Prize. Herb was never out of a job, but he saw more and more Americans lose theirs in the Depression. He said, I watched how FDR did something about it. It taught me that government can do the things that need to be done, to take up the well-being of the little guy, to speak the truth on his behalf. And from that fight, his pencil never strayed. A third-rate Washington newspaper had been bought by a gutsy new publisher. He wanted the prize-winning cartoonist to help him put the paper on the map. <clears throat> Herb insisted on editorial independence and the right to choose his own topics. The deal was struck, and in 1945, Herb was ready to draw it as he saw it. He was very serious about doing his homework and making sure that he got absolutely every fact down. Herb devoured everything. He would be in there at all hours. He'd also comb and shred newspapers throughout the day to pick out little things that sometimes went into his work and sometimes just went into another messy pile on his desk. And on one wall, there was a floor to ceiling stack of newspapers. And the first time I saw it, I said, Herb, what in the world is that wall of newsprint doing? And he said, well, you never know when you might have to look something up. He was a man who did not come to our editorial meetings and wasn't required to, because his cartoon 
was his opinion, not the opinion of the newspaper. With her, nothing was an issue. It was more a deep-seated wrong that needed writing because he felt strongly that people should be called to task if they were screwing around with the country in some way or another. Part of Herb's genius was in foreseeing things that others couldn't see or didn't dare see or might not be in license to see. For example, there was the cartoon of footsteps during Watergate leading right through the White House lawn and up to the door. Now that one made a few of us in the newsroom blanch, including I think some of the powers that be, but who were brave enough to let him do his thing. As we don't have the evidence of that yet, it's not clear. And he just saw it that way and put it that way. Did you see Block this morning? Holy! In each cartoon, he dug deeper into the Nixon White House, distilling the truth into his four by six inch column on the editorial page. His investigative work on Watergate, alongside Woodward and Bernstein and Roger Wilkins, jolted the country into action and won him the third of his four Pulitzer Prizes. They're the core of just anger and outrage and, and passion that says, this is the way this country needs to operate and I'm going to do my damnedest to get us there. It was a daily possibility getting up and doing that cartoon and affecting public life. We hear about poverty, civil rights, racism, equality, For his incisive wit and journalistic standards, he was awarded the Medal of Freedom by President Bill Clinton. He cited her blog for a half century of political cartoons that enlivened the minds and tweaked the sensibilities of millions of Americans. When you look back over the history of his drawings, he was right a huge percentage of the time. You know, he created a record. One of the most influential journalists of the 20th century, Herb liked to say, there are no wonder men or women. There are only you and I and others who believe in democracy. Think about the other guy and do something about it. Yeah, so it would be pretty nice piece to kind of give you a, a total base and, and probably what role can produce from the video and, and look at his work and what's there. He had a very real sense in his mind, at least, of what was right and what was wrong. And I think he also had a lot of pride in terms of the United States and what he was working on. A lot of his work uh, resonated with central themes. You see that in terms of uh, racism, in terms of equality, in terms of uh, women in terms of business, there were things in there that he looked at as they said in the film that he saw was wrong. Um, but rather than coming out with a speech or rather writings or something other provocative means, he did a very powerful cartoon. And why but why would he do that? We're gonna take a look at some of these cartoons and take a look at the things, but why do this one? He could have chosen so many other means, other ways of doing it. Um, even at those times over there, you see people doing all sorts of things these days. But why the cartoon? What's the what's the method? Why that that particular part of that methodology? Why why do that? Okay, can you talk to me more about that? What do you mean by that? Yes. 
So it's very quick. It comes at you. It's fast. He knows that people are constantly on the move. They don't have a lot of time to dwell or look on things, perhaps. But the cartoon there hits the message very quickly and does that. Right? Very true. Uh, any th other reason why he might have chosen to do that? I, I, I think it, it's wonderful. The editorial cartoonist is free to express his own opinion. So it gave him a way of not having to go along the mainstream. He could go independently to do what he wanted. Think about also cartoons themselves. I mean, when do we often see cartoons in our own life? Go. It's not, they just say, oh, it's just science fiction, it's just an opportunity. Absolutely. That, that allows you to bypass that to be able to do it. Also, it, it might even resonate with us in terms of a more emotional level. Think about what we see in growing up as cartoons, prominent cartoons, talking about comics ourselves, looking at that, and how that resonates. If we go back to our childhood, we look at that, it hits us with an emotion. And if you can do that, it will stay with you. You may have forgotten by the day's end the morning story that you were reading with your father, but that cartoon may stay with you for days. Powerful enough, it might even stay with you for weeks. You go, remember her walk he did? Oh my gosh, this is coming in. So there may be a method to the madness. You saw that indeed in, when he was growing up, you know, they, they always like to say, well, yes, he was playing with chalk when he was growing up. So maybe that had something to do with it. You never know. Uh, but indeed, there may have been something to it. When we take a look at his work itself, and what we're going to do is take a look at a few images, and if you would like, um, I thought it would be kind of more constructive, and we can just stay as a whole group if we like, but I think it would be very interactive. Take a look at the message. We'll start with this one right here. Take a look at the cartoon there, and look at for the obvious message that is resonating what it's saying. But I also want you to look at the subtleties. For her block, it wasn't just coming out with a message. There were little intricacies. Notice the, the, the features, the characters, the colors, the area. Look at the border that's around or lack thereof. Look at how the words are put into play. Take all that into account. So not only the obvious message of what it may be portraying, but why did he choose to make it and say the message in the way he did that? It may give us more of a window into the person himself. So take a look at that and see what you think. I mean, to begin with, what is the obvious message? There? What is what is this thing really depicting? Okay, uh, so you have the, the big business there. We've seen that as a trend that hasn't gone away in our, our own society today. Big business saying, let me run my own business, government basically but out. Um, and he doesn't just mention any kind of business. You see it put right up there on the sign, oil. Uh, so big oil business is telling the government to butt out with it. So, Again, it's kind of a play on that big businesses kind of run themselves. But what are the subtleties behind it? I mean, he could have said it in any way. Uh, they certainly wrote stories. It's an, it's an old thing. We've seen it before many times in our country. Why this? I mean, take a look at, first of all, the characters, the representation of Uncle Sam. Why is Uncle Sam depicted that way? When, what does Uncle Sam look like? What does our, the face of our government look like? Stern, serious. <laughs> Uncompromising, yes. And so it looks like he's, he's probably drawing hard there. But notice, is the government saying anything? No, it's kind of quiet, stern. I mean, it doesn't look like it's in it. And clearly, there was a frown on the face. Why the frown? Why not just a, a happy face, sad face? So why the frown? Exactly. He doesn't approve of it, but what can he do? Hands are his pockets, aren't they? Right, his hands are, are kind of in his pockets. He's kind of like this. Because to challenge that could be very problematic because this has a lot of influence, a lot of power that's there, oil especially. So going into that, you have to look at it. And look how the depiction of the the baron, if you will, the oil baron that's there. How is his to be? 
it looks that way. I certainly I don't see any smoke coming out of it, but there's clearly something going on right there. Yes. Notice how he's standing though. Is he is he like this? Is he like that? He's aggressive. He's going right. Now the government isn't backing down, but at the same time, this is a very aggressive stance there that's putting him to it. And so look at the shades. Notice the colors. Why did he depict the colors? Notice in the in the front it's very dark. In the back, it's very light. What would be the meaning behind that? To me, it would be the secondary effects, which means pollution. Yes. Comes to, comes to mind. And that that in there is like a smog. Notice the smog that comes in there. It's, he's kind of talking in many ways as a subtlety in terms of looking at our environment. Kind of a very clever way of saying, hey, you need to take more of a look at your environment without actually saying it. But it does resonate there. But also that this is a very personal issue. It deals with people. That's in the background. This is something that's much more direct. So you can kind of see there's a lot that goes into it. What about the words themselves, though? I think the sign, if he had just put the oil industry on that sign, it would have been really as pungent. Because the oil the resources of the United States, the point here is he's saying, get out of something that maybe you should have a hand. Hey, yes, so he's definitely putting it out. It's, it's definitely in your face. It's a message that that this isn't something that's just in the background. So you've got to you've got to address it. You've got to deal with it, much like a bulletin board. So this is a great example of it. Let's take a look now at another one and see what we have here. Um, this is a very powerful one. And we some of these will go some we want, but the red lines, and then certainly that hit him, especially the Franklin Roosevelt era, which I think was a very uh, pivotal point for him. In his career, what is this one saying? It's getting worse. But notice how he does it. This was a very clever individual. I mean, the line on the top, how does that resonate to you? I mean, yes, it's getting worse. But does it resonate to you? Does it make you feel personal that this is something that could affect you yourself? Especially if you're important. Probably not. I mean, you see it. We see stats all the time. You know, you hear, well, unemployment is this, the stock market went this, we're hearing this, but we hear numbers. However, this is another line. How does that resonate with you? And notice in the video, he saw those lines that were there, and he put that line in there. You can hear stats all you want, when you go to work and you see a line like that, that is how you know. And notice again, just like in the first one, the person, his characters, his people, generally speaking, are right out in front. You don't see the people way out in the back. And notice what you see in the background, just as you mentioned with the spot. What do you see in the background? Yes, factories not working, buildings, structures. And it, notice he could have made that background as detailed as he did the front. But notice it's in, almost as if it's fading away. It's disappearing. Yes, and that's his point, that if this doesn't, isn't resolved, that could go away. Oh, here's a one, here's another one. I and mean, he was very direct with what he did. What is the meaning behind this? And this is a fascinating one. The Statue of Liberty, obviously the torch, freedom. And, and you get the guy screaming fire, and notice what's on his pants. Hysteria. What do you think is behind that? What's the obvious message? Mm -hmm. Scare, dealing with uh, what we saw as, as communism. We were scared of the Russians. You know, then. But uh, what else is he is he worried about? Why is the the person in the panic climbing to the ladder with the, with the torch and the hand? This is what's resonating. They find what they perceived as a communist infiltration. They were infringing on the civil liberties of Americans. Yes. So liberty was in danger. Liberty was in danger, so the person's running hysterically to do that. But there's a fear. Notice the subtleties. That's the obvious message, but the fear, the other meaning behind it is if he runs in and throws all that water and blows out that torch, liberty. Working. No more freedom. Is yeah. the blame upon the American people Exactly. And that makes you kind of look at it, look, makes you think about it. And again, notice the colors. He darkens those areas that he wants you to emphasize, that he wants you to see. And he keeps brightness in terms of the other areas 
that are more passive. Here's another one. This was something he also was a major theme about him, and that was, of course, equality in terms of money, class, if you will. Richest country in the world, and obviously we see the school there now. I'm reminded almost like the Alamo. I don't know if you've been to mm -hmm. Texas and seen any of those big buildings, and you can see the Alamo, the church in the middle, you know, like that. What is the obvious message here? Okay. Here's what we are. Not schools. Yes. So there is an yes, an inner city school so specifically. He could have pointed any school anywhere, but he puts this very purposely in the city. Exactly. Which says that our emphasis is not in the school. Why does that matter? You think that you know what he's saying? Obviously, we're not pointing in the school, but why is that a problem? We, we make the claim we're the richest country in the world, yet we have people that aren't able to uh, to be able to go to school. We don't have enough schools to get all the people in there. And so there's that push there. And notice the crowded effect. You now all this being pushed around and stuff and, and being put it almost as if we're just trying to squeeze these in as a filler to be able to do it. This is it. I like that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate to that. Yes. Some of the one of the big deal things about his work is that it still resonates very much. Well, exactly. Yes. Exactly. yes, they're kind of I mean, you could pick any period and, and still look and go, oh my gosh, what is the what is the obvious message there? And yes, those are definitely cigars. <laughs> <laughs> What's the obvious message here? Yes. Yes. Can't run, can't get in. So we see huge campaigns, private interest, buying the, the state senator. And note how he depicts it. First of all, notice that you know they're looking at the chairs, the seats there. But look at the two individuals that he has doing that. He could have used any type of individual, any type of caricature to do that. What do those two individuals represent? I mean, why, why did he make them the way they are? You, give me some traits about them. What do you see about them? Very satisfied. Yeah, they feel complete, satisfied, kind of smug. Oh, yeah, they feel confident. Confident, they yes. Mm -hmm. um, Very familiar. What else do you know about them? Do they look like they're suffering? They're hurting. Yeah, they're 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 yes, they're they're they're, 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 they're they're very yes. Life is good, you know. Breakfast to meal. Yeah, exactly. Cigar here. The guy's got the goggles there. Think about it. And there's also moments of business as usual mm -hmm. attitude towards it. But once again, look at the color. Where does he put the black? The emphasis on the center seats, where they sit, where they rest focus on that. So you have both the uh, both backgrounds being laid on the front. Oh. Yes. What happened to the one we used to have? But what is the message here? The obvious message. It's not wrong. It's pretty important. We want you on your side. We don't need, we don't want you unless you have something against us. It's not sending your little messages anymore, right? Mm -hmm. The hand gesture is very, very important. Yes, and she doesn't want to see. Yeah. So it's blind to that. What do you think you are when you come in here? That's truly isn't That's there. And notice how he's depicted. He seems very open himself. What is his manner? What is his demeanor that you see there? And again, note the black, where it's put in the front. And also, this is the cleverness of cartoons, like you were mentioning, where they can get away with. It. Notice the individual behind him. Now, I'm not making any illusions here or, or doing stuff, but note the mustache. 
That's a good question. Is Truman the one saying what happened to the one we used to have? Or is Truman and Bill reinforcing what she's saying as this individual? Who is this man? Is he, is he an immigrant? Is he someone coming to take a look? Is he visiting? Is he really behind Truman? Maybe. I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So both parties are. That would be investing in what you do it here and say both parties are. Right. I think the ambiguity is kind of what we do. Because you're not quite sure. My interpretation is the, the two guys are saying, hey, what fits on the wall behind us? Mm -hmm. And this guy is obviously looking kind of shocked and, ooh, what is this? And so I'd be kind of curious who this is supposed to look like. But and you see, he sort of has a, I don't know if it's a braid or something, maybe think more of a fashion, maybe something not indigenous. Maybe. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Maybe yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Well, think about in, in terms of her block and his impact. He started out there with Franklin Roosevelt. He was very much a proponent for the New Deal. He very much was a proponent for helping people. When Truman took over, um, you know, you had that restricted. Truman was very kind of more of an introvert in many ways, and was very much doing this a lot of stuff with things because he was going now with the, the Soviet Union. There was a lot of restrictions with things and stuff. And so, in some ways, people were disappointed that he didn't continue. As aggressively the New Deal is when you most likely. It's quite possible. Like you said, the ambiguity we kind of look at the question. But you know, maybe Herbach was saying, hey, we're not we're not going in the right direction anymore. This is the, we were doing good and now we stop. And this way of kind of critiquing it. It's a, it's an interesting one, but certainly it does make you think and, and look at it. Well, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, it would be doing that today, but they don't know. Uh, oh, yeah, but they, if it was today, that's a funny thing. How would Herbot do it today? Well, maybe have a drone. <laughs> yeah. Most people are antiquated. Well, notice this one. So, what is the obvious message here that he's trying to say? Yeah, our civil rights are definitely at the end of that. The wiretapping, this reminds me of Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King era, and what the FBI was all doing and wiretapping him with family and everyone else that was associated with the civil rights movement. And they may have even gotten people who totally just. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, it wasn't even a part of it, but they made it. If there was any kind of identification whatsoever, it didn't matter. They still did the investigations and then they still attacked. They still did it. They still reported. Note where he has, once again, the black, the, the emphasis of the cartoon that he's put in there. Notice where he draws your eyes to. The yeah, shade is pulled down. And the, the earphones, which is the phones, the exactly. to the phone conversation. Yes. I don't know what that is. A friend of a book. This here? That that uh, looks to me like uh, there's a plug coming out of it, so maybe it's a tape record uh, oh, to, to be able to get the thing, the information on, so the legend will put it. Notice how what those items are, they're all laid out on the floor, though, depicting tools. And it isn't just some individual coming in randomly, they have the equipment to be able to do all this. Here on that one. Yeah, if I can get up. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't make that out. But I know we've got those on the board, I think, outside. Um, mm -hmm. But the, that also gives you a depiction when you look at the year, in terms of also figuring out what's going on with it. But what does that have to do with the American civil rights? The other thing I picked up from on the board was that the shades were drawn. Yes. So it was like undercover stuff mm -hmm. that they were doing. Um, but what's that to do with civil rights? Yes, they are. And they are absolutely uh, ignoring them. Mm -hmm. Ignoring your rights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's drinking, Betty. Okay, I think you yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Uh -huh. So they we're, we're that part. Again, we're roughly within that same period. Yeah. 
Now here is here's where you see a little bit in terms of him looking at the he was very much a stout opponent. He was not a, a fan of communism. So he, in his way, he certainly was against the Soviet Union and many things. You mean some can and don't do it, assuming that it's two individuals there that are pulling the cart. And notice the individual that has totalitarianism um, that's using the, the carriage with the whip. What is the obvious message here? Everyone else terrible. Mm -hmm. Please vote. Don't forget to vote. Uh -huh. So what, what is he saying in that? That you deserve. <laughs> and that was something that Herb Locke was saying. And then one of the boards that you have out there, he said, you get the government you deserve, but his part of his anger was that we weren't getting the government you deserve. As part of what he's depicting, is totalitarianism, you see this in other governments, it's more of a depiction really of the Soviet Union, that big, you see, notice the individual is very big, very domineering, if you will, and the two individuals there, they don't have the ability, obviously, to vote. And yet, over there, with the American flag and stuff that we do, don't forget to vote. And yet, the signs, you can perfectly pick it up. Instead of just saying vote, those signs are huge, so trying to remind people you, you've got to vote. Because if you don't, Mm -hmm. So notice how he interlays both of those with him. Before we get to that. So funny, he's such a quiet individual, yet his language is fun. Here we go. I'm not going to say the last part, but wait for your leaders. <laughs> now, what's the obvious message here? This has some very powerful um, symbolism going into it. Okay. That, or is it that people are going to, or is it that people need to? Yeah. That maybe it takes the people to do it. I mean, one of the things that in these debates that we're seeing being done on both parties, I think we're hearing a lot of frustration with Congress, the government on all sides going. Why isn't more being done with this, more being done with that, and stuff? So there is maybe that wave of do we need to do it ourselves in some forms, fashion, and such. Maybe the people need to take these issues there because does it look like the leaders are going to? And no, he has all the names of them: yes, Nixon, Johnson, Eisenhower, Labor. And how does he depict our leaders? The impression that I got from mm -hmm. the facial expressions is, okay, guys, these people, let us do this. Okay, no more protesting, no more bringing up issues, just fall all of this whole stuff. That's the, that's the impression that I think of. Mm -hmm. Kind of a frustration, kind of like, hey, you're, you're getting ahead, we need to let do us it. Do this. Yeah, let us do it. But notice all their eyebrows in there, as you said, frustrating and anger. Notice also the, the facial expressions, the nose the eyebrows, the, and the, the mouths, and what they have are very unattractive. Yes? What is that on Nixon's, like it almost looks like he's wearing a mask. It does, doesn't it? That, that, I think it's a pencil. Oh, the pencil. There we go. Yeah, I think mean, you're right. A pencil that he, he took there with him. And nothing a cartoonist would do would not just be random. I mean, he had to take time to draw that for whatever reason it's there. But clearly, they're on the bottom, and people are having an uphill battle to do that. It takes momentum. And notice it's not two or three individuals. Are doing that. It takes a whole, a whole bunch to be able to do that. Here's a good one. Very much civil rights, equality. Her block was all about equality. We certainly pushed it. Him, there was a, again, right and wrong. If we're going to be equal. Everyone needs to be equal. That's what these messages were. What is he saying here? The continuation of the launch. This has a lot of things. I can settle. You're absolutely right. You're right. The million man, million dollar, a million man march. You have you have people marching for civil rights and such. But it isn't more than just marching in the streets and stuff. You have to take that to the vote. So who is he appealing to? Who is he sending this message to in his cartoon? Is he just sending it as a general message? No, I think. I think to African Americans also, not only to people 
hey, we, this has to be continued, but also with African Americans, you've got to do this all the way. You can't just stop. You've got to go all the way to the voting and make this happen. It's not enough just to march and wave signs and stuff. You've got to take it to the next step. Exactly. So he pushes that. He, he goes with it. Again, another thing I stole. Are you detecting a theme about what he's doing? Notice the suburban heights public school. There, there's a good And notice, notice how he uses the shape. It's one of the most powerful tools that he has. Right. Yes. Where is he? Exactly. And notice how he has it here with cans being knocked over, yes. things being done. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Look at these all day. Oh goodness. Okay. I believe that's uh, Jimmy Carter. Who's in charge here? He's slamming on the on the, on the president's desk with a visitor's guide to Washington. What's the what's the obvious message here? Okay. What was this when he was in office? I believe 1979. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. He didn't know he was in charge. <laughs> well, what was the one thing? They were letting him. They were letting him in charge. Is maybe one way to look. Notice one of the things that uh, President Jimmy Carter was elected on is they were seen as an outsider, and the idea was an outsider might be able to come in and change the atmosphere or the, or the feeling of it in terms of the outlook. In many ways, he did in terms of what was viewed there. But you can, as you said, if there's an ambiguity to it. You can look at this cartoon in different ways. On the one hand. You can look at it and say, okay, he's coming in there, he's a visitor's guy, he's bringing an outside in there, realizing there's no one in charge or there's no direction here, something needs to be done. On the other hand, though, this is kind of deep, deep, I would think, in his presidency. You can also look at it and go, okay, um, is he able to do anything? He's banging his fist on When people bang their fist on something, what is he reason? Yes, maybe they're not doing what he needs, maybe he can't get it done, but there's obviously some resistance there. And maybe being an outsider didn't give him the advantage that maybe he hoped he would be able to have. And he micromanaged um, and didn't delegate. He got what he had to read everything. So I'm wondering what the overall message he thought he had to read everything that came to the office himself rather than trusting everybody. Do you think her blog so was indicating that as well with the, the big visitor's guide that he's got in there and stuff like that? Make sure he's reading going through it. Yeah. That was one of the things that they, they didn't know. It was a strength, but also a weakness. That he definitely looked at things very specifically when he had it. So why is he too short? Why? <laughs> Good point. Now you're starting to pick things up. Nothing's done without reason. Why are his pants too short? Oh, here's a good one. I believe this was, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, 1984. So Reagan at this point was there. Do um, you think his administration has been bad? His domestic policies are no good. You can't believe what he says. He might get us into a war, and you're going to vote for him, right? And this looks like the individual is very happy. Saying that. So they did indeed. What is the what's the obvious message here? We're done. Okay. Or they, <laughs> Now that's a clever way of Harbaugh kind of trying to reach the masses, and he doesn't want to come out and say in his opinion, you know, maybe you need to rethink things or look at stuff, but he can do it through a cartoon and possibly get away with it. I know it's a symbolic act of the of the father there with the child and stuff like that, the individual who looks content. But with a beard. With a beard, yes. Now, isn't that interesting? I mean, he doesn't have beer written on it. I mean, that could be a can of coffee, maybe. Juice or soda, but, but what the assumption is it's a beer. Yes, and the TV behind him there with it. And notice where he puts the darker shades this time. Why would he do that? Why darken that? He could have darkened the coats. He could have darkened a lot of other things, but he really emphasizes the pants. No, he looks like he's got a belt. Certainly, the individual with the the trim, the coat, 
um, has that one piece. Why are we nervous? What does it indicate when you are able to have your pants kind of tight or you have your pants? Notice they're all, they're basically baggy. Yes. Baggy with the individual he's saying is a problem. Tight with the individual that works for the government. What is that name? Is it more tailored? I don't know. Plenty. It may be a way of looking at economics in terms of plenty. Things are good, so you're not going to be thinking about it. As long as everything seems to be going great, the pants are an indicator that you're most in front of you. You've got sweatpants. I can relax. Or they're, they're loose fitting, so I can fit in them and stuff like that. I don't even think about anything. So life is good. That's the emphasis there. It might be what you just pointed to. <laughs> All right, this will be our last one, and I want to kind of bring this together. I believe this emphasizes George Bush. It's one of the more popular ones um, that you put out, I think, in 2000. You can believe it because I'll simply decide that's how it will be. And then you see all the signs there a big tax cut, big money, free lunch, dinner, breakfast, and we did it. Um, what is he saying there with that? Right. Well, remember one of the things that George Bush uh, Sr. was noted for was to read my lips. Read my lips. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, what is his message there with that? What is he, what is he saying? Reminded. And notice he puts that in the very center, free lunch, so you right. see all that that's in there. Yes. And the shady ones again are all the people. So you see the, the suits that are there. This plays a little bit, I think, up with me. But I just wrote the truth, a lot of the fallacy is that she's saying I say this so that people can believe it. I mean that's you know Bush ran into some problems with that. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it, again, and it's his way of looking at it. What patterns do you see looking at all these cartoons that are there and what we looked at? What do you see about these that tell you a little bit about the man himself? What's the whole government the higher standard? Okay. He's got a bar, and obviously these cartoons depict that the government isn't there yet with it. And so he's this is his way of checking. Is he just trying to make people aware? He's certainly doing that with his cartoons. So I think they have a message. Yes. It wants to call to action. Yeah. It's a call to action for a very subtle, very quiet, happy individual that's there. I'm sure he was. His cartoons are very powerful. You notice the person on the DVD said, gosh, I didn't realize that that was him. Because these days, you know, he figures he was a monster was running around the hallway from Washington Post. But we would never believe this nice, quiet individual would put these powerful things out. So yes, this is a person that does not believe in standing still. Things have to be done. It is a call to action. What else do you know about him? Okay, there is more of a liberal mindset with it. Mm -hmm. Now, we had an interesting discussion just a little bit about that in the beginning. Um, on the one hand, you know, what the, the, the political terms often change, and certainly over the span of decades, what was behind them. So what was a liberal or conservative decades ago is maybe a little bit different now than it had been before. So it's interesting to look at that. With certainly the, the New Deal, he was a proponent of that. Um, at the same time, though, he was not a big believer in those utopian kind of ideas like communism and such. Like that. Um, so it's, it's something you look at and you wrestle with. You go, I don't know, what, what was he doing? But he does have liberal tendencies in terms of what he was uh, espousing, certainly individuality and things like that. What else do you think he was making big money and business? His cartoons were. Right, his cartoons were definitely that. against that. Yeah. So you definitely saw that around. Did you know in the beginning, oh, as as we started getting more towards the closer, you know, our own time, his cartoons started to have a lot more of the individuality of, of the people that were there. He started really looking at them. Whereas in the beginning, there were much more broader constructs and issues and stuff. As if he was becoming now starting to personalize a little bit more on the, the people versus the broader aspects and that. You see that evolution of his thinking through his work that he's putting in. 
one or two, if it was if there was it was so cultural thing too that maybe it was less okay for the back then to really put fingers to individuals and, and more and more now, you know, if you're if you're a politician, you're gonna get blamed for something, you know. I think if you try to pick the words about and they used to say that I think sometime in the back in the fifties or sixties where they political commentators and media you would start living in the person. Sure, and that's a great thing that you mentioned about the cultural things and how those also affected the cartoons that were there. You can see through his works, and you saw it also in the DVD, this was an individual that sat you know, in his office, he had papers there, and these are not cartoons that he just threw on the content. These things required thought, processing, and it was a message. Everything he put in there was designed to reach you on a subtlety level, psychological level, that got you to think and do things. Just an author that does his research so exactly. Yes. Yeah, that's and all of that wrapped up, not in a big volume manuscript or a report or in a cartoon, a depiction that's there, wrapped into it, where he takes all that and his brain processes it and puts it in. And as you remember, so indeed this is an individual whose work really will last the, the test of time and delivers it far past his own life. His work will continue to speak volumes about it and has that immortality in the sense of that these issues won't go away. They may change names or different forms, but they'll always be there. I'm like, what's the question? That's what's so amazing in this question. The same cartoons could run. Yes, a little bit of tweaking here and there, absolutely. Maybe we'll put that drone there and stuff like that. But otherwise, <laughs> but otherwise yes, you're absolutely right. Yes. The same, the same message. The same message. The same message. Issues. And that's where her block comes in. That one certain big thing about it is that it, you won't get what you need unless you do have a call to action that you play a very active part. You do get the government you deserve. It's always one of the main things to put into it. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you coming. Um, if you want to look a little more, we can. I want to take just a few seconds here and certainly thank Robin, who has done wonderful in putting these things together. She Try to bring the community together with different depictions of stories. Her efforts are very much appreciated and we're very thankful. And while I have them here, we have our, my chair, Stephen Johnson, who does a great job in trying to bring different programs that we have in our college and stuff like that. And I think the, it's the awareness, it's the discussions that really help us to kind of reiterate that theme that we're on. Well, thank you very much. Can you look your name? Yes, yeah. actually, look, there's a question. Uh, something just hit me once. Um, you, you actually did quite well in bringing out what what an artist might say, you know, about foreground background figures, dark colors, and things like that. Yeah. And, uh, do, do you know, uh, I don't know how deeply you've gone into the artistic side of it, but, but I noticed, for example, the one with the bread line, the line of people actually was geometrically parallel with the line of the graph. And I that just kind of caught my eye. I missed that. And I didn't, but I didn't know if, if if he you know if he paid any attention. I mean, yes. well, he was an artist. Yes. He must have from yes. his perspective. Yeah, yeah. I'm just it, it was you know, like like it was like. Yeah, I think that that intent must be there because it's the graph paper. You know what I mean? exactly? You're right. Yes, if the bread line had, had gone the other way, yeah. 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 you're right. Yeah. 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 No, I, I think you hit it, hit it perfect because one thing I do know is that they don't do anything usually without a reason. And you're right, that line is going up with that, and, it, and it, it does play into it. I don't know if he did that intentionally or there was, it's a, it's a gift. I mean, he was able to resonate and do things in there that we can learn, but he seemed to have an instinct for it to be able to bring it in. I don't know if that was something he logically put together and said, okay, this is the form to do all that to make that parallel to reiterate right. whatever his artistic training. Sure, he learned it intellectually early on, and then came Well, you know, he was trying to get an art degree, so it's quite yeah, possible right. that some of the courses, the instructors, the professors he had there, they had given him some of the knowledge to think in those terms. Yeah, brought it into his work. And he had the talent for this twelve years old. 
a powerful combination. Yes. I still have a question about his role as a cartoonist mm -hmm. being employed by the Washington Post and not having to pass their editorial inspection. Mm -hmm. So I was. But how does that work for editorialists in general? You know? Yeah. How does that They know what they're getting when they hire someone. They're toast today and authors up there. They, they know his perspective and his philosophy. And he throws it so he ticks somebody off and he gets fired. <laughs> 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 it sounded like Black yeah. negotiated that part, not having not to. Yeah. And then he gave him a Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that how so all of his cartoons were on the editorial page? Oh, yeah. yeah. All of them. Yeah. All of them. Yeah. So he yeah. was able yeah. to turn it over without supervision or without. Well, what this writing, I mean, obviously, was a writing, so as you say, you're able to kind of be able to get away with a little bit more of what's going on there, plus the draw of it. I mean, he was able to bring people in when he started winning those awards, and the name recognition itself kind of put it in there. And notice in his things, I mean, he never, from what we see, I mean, I heard a term today with it and stuff like that, where basically he got your attention, but he never crossed that line. I mean, he never went too far where you were like, oh my gosh, oh, it's it's it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Where he had that cultural awareness to know where he stood. It'd be interesting, though, to see on our climate now where we look at some of these and go, okay, well, maybe that's what we're pushing it, where, what he would do in a current cartoon. There, there are people today who would criticize some cartoons as, um, as being outrageous, mm -hmm. right? It was funny. But to the actual extent, they criticize the regular cartoon. It shouldn't have been a cartoon page, it wasn't in a book. And I thought, oh, this is something children can see. But he. Well, oh, no, he got there. Well, I think that's why Jewsbury got moved to the first page. Sure. Oh, yeah. Right. 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 You know, that's one of those things. I love it. Yeah. We'll, we'll have an answer for you, Ray. <laughs> you had an honor to respond to the question. I think it was kind of answered a little bit, but I'm just sitting up here contemplating how many phone calls did you get when you saw, I mean, a paper? How many phone calls did the paper get when people saw, like, the Eisenhower name on the jackets at the bottom? And did the paper. At one point, say no, you can't do this. And that's that's the part of interesting. Something like that. Say no, right. that, that's something. Looking at the, and that would be an interesting thing to interview the editors, the people that are involved. So you know, there's a lot of those little stories that you don't see that you know were maybe hushed up. I think one of the things that was a key though was how much, how many papers they were selling ah, and circulation. Yes, and if the circulation is yes. good, you might get a yes, few phone calls to complain, yeah, but yeah, hey, yeah, we're, we're we're selling so. We can kind of work with it. Um, you know, it's kind of like when you see with sponsors. Well, maybe in that particular one, too, with the poor character, you had two liberals and two conservatives. So I think it just kind of. Oh, so it kind of balances. Yeah, Nixon and Eisenhower yeah, on yeah, one side. Balances. Yeah, maybe he was aware of that. I don't think that Eisenhower was. Well, I mean, technically, I guess. I mean, obviously not. Not like No, no, no. But I guess, I guess, like, which way do you it does, and it, it, it does give you a window into it. Other, other questions? Well, like, yes. 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 Oh, go ahead. What is your next question? It was an Johnson. Johnson. Later. Uh, 
And notice who has the end of all the four individuals. The one that has his hand up is Isaac, who played a typical role. Other, yeah, that's the last phase. The political feed, I should say. If you put a cartoon, I, mean, I just remember it now. I didn't just remember it. Was, I saw the exhibit just came back to mind. So I haven't done a lot of research and reading about her block. But the other thing is, what was the feedback that he got from doing some of these? Uh, were people calling him and threatening him? Yes. That's not what we want to hear about. Um, I, 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 I think you, if you look at the time, I mean, I have no doubt that uh, you know there were certainly calls made. There were people angry. Maybe even uh, officials, certainly in the, in the White House staff and stuff, saying, "Hey, you know, you need to sign with this or, or watch it." I'm sure that went on. But at the same time, it, again, you're you're selling things. You're getting circulation. Also, he didn't just grab the stuff and just say out of the blue. There was talk. There was rumor. There was, there was thinking on it. And so I'm sure a lot of that went behind the scenes, and he must have had some powerful individuals oh, that were there um, to look at that and do it. And then once, once the momentum carried forward, then you were fine with that stuff. So. Yeah. He was brave with the big I looked at that and I said, oh my gosh, look what this guy is saying, look what he's done. He's so big. I'm a visual person, and he just made such a big statement. And I have read everything that the guys had written about, but when I saw that, whoa, yes. Also, you can't underestimate uh, ego. You know, when individuals are in powerful positions, they'll disregard things. I mean, what did Nixon really care about a uh, lot cartoon? I mean, so it's a cartoon in the post. Who cares? I mean, who's going to really see anything to that? And then by the time it starts to really have that effect, you know, well, then by then you've got several people over so sometimes hiding within, again, his medium was genius to be able to hide within that, within the paper, within the paper and the organizations that are there to be able to do it. I mean, he could go, and if you look at it, you know, he has that quote unquote, well, he's just an average person. He's not in anything special, right? So you get that tent. So I have a great answer, but let's see how you hear one more Letters. Journalist, there was one. Maybe there was Carol, who was for Carol. Um, but uh, it actually doesn't even list her a lot. He only wants three individuals, and of course, wants to share. But uh, it's all the large individuals. I don't know if that's the thing. Other questions? Thanks for coming. I appreciate it.